Good morning. As you've already noticed, Kevin and I have switched jobs today. You might be asking yourself what an associate pastor does. And I don't know about other associate pastors, but I can tell you what my job description looks like. It has two sentences. Sentence one, butt of Kevin's jokes. <laughs> sentence two, other duties as assigned. So the uh, Kevin's announcement, yikes. All right, Kevin's, during Kevin's announcement, I fulfilled the first one. Now I get to fulfill the second. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, that you bring us together, Lord, as family, to, to hear from your word, Lord, to be changed through encountering you. Lord, I just pray that, that you would speak to us this morning through this amazing passage, and Lord, that you would use it to conform our hearts to Christ. It's in his name I pray, amen. So we've been in Acts for a while, and we're going to be in Acts for a while. It's the, through this year, we're going to do up to chapter 12. And so we're taking breaks here and there. But this is our fifth message in our look at the book of Acts. And I want to set a context for the passage that's actually happening this morning. So let's review a bit. Luke, author of the Gospel of Luke, also wrote Acts as the second book of a two-volume set, Luke-Acts to give a Roman official named Theophilus an orderly history of the life of Jesus and the development of the early church. That's why he wrote it. So uh, Acts, the book of Acts, picks up at just before Jesus' resurrection, and he tells his disciples to remain in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. Remain in Jerusalem until you get, you get given the gift of the Holy Spirit, until it's poured out on them. And then Jesus ascends into heaven. And they're looking up into the air trying to figure out what the heck's happening. And an angel appears and says, what are you doing? Go back to Jerusalem, like he said. Wait. So they do. They, they listen to what he said. They go back to Jerusalem. And 10 days after that, uh, corresponding to the Jewish feast called Pentecost or the Festival of Weeks or Shavuot in Hebrew, it's a harvest festival. It's the early harvest festival. There's two of them. There's a total of three festivals uh, where everybody has to show up. Uh, but this is one of them. It's called Pentecost in the Greek. The Holy Spirit comes. So the, the apostles and a total of 120 people are in an upper room when something that sounds like a rushing wind comes into the place and then something that looks like tongues of fire come and rest over each of the people that are there. And the most amazing thing starts happening. They start speaking in languages they had not previously known. It'd be pretty wild, right? And all of a sudden, you know, not Spanish, but things like Russian or whatever, something I haven't had any experience with whatsoever. I'll just, and it's intelligible. It's wild. So there's a lot of people in Jerusalem for the feast. They're from all over the world. Um, scholars think that they had 50,000 kind of as a, as a population of Jerusalem itself, which would swell to over 200,000 for the different feasts. And this is going on. So the folks that are in Jerusalem at this time, Luke says it like this. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, those would be residents of modern-day Iran, uh, residents of Mesopotamia, that would be modern-day Iraq, Judea, that's where Jerusalem is, and then Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia. And, or Pamphylia, that's modern day Turkey. And then Egypt and parts of Libya, people are there from Rome, from the Isle of Crete, which is in the Mediterranean, 
uh, and then or Arabs. Cretans and Arabs are there as well. And that would be people living on the Arabian Peninsula. So modern day Saudi Arabia, Yemen, the United Arab Emirates, those countries. The whole Mediterranean and Northern Africa and the Middle East, folks from everywhere. And so all of a sudden, they start hearing these guys who are known as Galileans. They're from the area of Galilee for the most part. They're, they're kind of the Lake Sidians of, of Jerusalem, you know, ways away, kind of the Hicks. Sorry, those of you who live in Lakeside. My apologies. I should have said Texans. I don't know. All right. But you get the idea. They live a ways away. And all of a sudden, these people are speaking all of these different languages. And so there's some that are out there. It causes a ruckus and it draws a crowd. And so there's people kind of freaking out about what's going on and trying to figure it out. And they're like, oh, pff, those guys are hammered. They're drunk. That must be what's happening. Well, I, let me explain it like this. In my earlier life, I had substantial experience with trying to speak while drunk. And while I wasn't necessarily speaking English, it wasn't any other intelligible language either, I can tell you. So being drunk is not a good explanation for suddenly knowing or being able to communicate in another language. So, the, but it's in this context that Peter, under the influence of the newly poured out Holy Spirit, gives his first sermon. And this sermon's vital. Luke uses it in Acts as a foundation for things that he will talk about for the rest of the book. He gives it to him, you know, gives it to him in this chunk, and then he will constantly refer back to this stuff as he's writing the rest of the book to Theophilus. But it's also foundational to the New Testament because it tells us who Christ is, who Jesus is. It's what theologians call a very high Christology, and it sets the stage for the rest of the New Testament as well. So that's what we're looking at. It's uh, pretty lengthy. It's 27 verses long, and we are just, we're just going to walk through the story. Um, I put some of the key verses from the, the passage in the front page of the bulletin because there's just not room for all 27 of them. And so feel free to, to go read it on your own. It's Acts, 14, or Acts 2, 14 to 41. But we're going to walk through it, and we're going to talk about some stuff along the way. So up on the screen, it should be verse 14, Peter stood up with the 11. Now, remember, there's 12 total. Matthias has already been chosen earlier in the book of Acts to replace Judas Iscariot who killed himself. So the 12 are at their full complement. So Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem. Uh, maybe, maybe a better translation of that might be people of Judah, those of you who live here, and all of the rest of you who are visiting for the feast. All of you who are dwelling in Jerusalem, those of you who are here. Peter says, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. Now, both of these phrases are written in what's called the imperative in Greek. It's the language of command. It is the equivalent of Peter going, getting up and going, hey, listen up. This is important. Pay attention. These people, going on to verse 15, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. So the first thing he does is refute the ridiculous accusation. Obviously, they're not drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. That's what he says. It's, only nine, it's the third hour is the way that it's actually written, but on the Jewish clock, it's nine in the morning. So these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is important because Peter's pulling from the Old Testament scriptures. There's not a, the New Testament scriptures are being written as Luke is writing this. There's not a New Testament for them to look at yet. He's pulling from the Old Testament scriptures. There are, uh, to help people get a grip on what's happening. And, and think about it this way. In this time, there really was an anticipation of Messiah coming and making all things right. So even though the majority of us will find out missed the idea of Jesus being the Messiah, they were looking for a Messiah. So Peter gets up and he starts talking. And he says, in the last days, and this is him quoting the, quoting the prophet Joel, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will pro prophesy. Now, this is absolutely fascinating to me, just the different groups that are talked about. Not even Peter understands the full enormity of the revelation that he's been given, that he's now giving to the people around him. He doesn't get the big picture yet. 
He's working his way through it too. He's spot on, and we'll see it as we go on, but Peter struggles with it. But check out the, this sweeping nature of whom, on whom God will pour out his spirit. All. Pour out his spirit on all people, not just Jews, but Gentiles too. It's a big deal. There's no differentiation based on race or ethnicity. It's not about one chosen group of people anymore. In the last days, he'll pour out his spirit on all people. This is a fulfillment of something that God promised Abraham, that he would be a blessing to all of the families of the earth. The Spirit's poured out on all people. That's in Genesis 12. So, and Peter won't understand what God meant by all until chapter 10 when he runs into a guy named Cornelius who was a Roman. The Spirit will be poured out on all people. There's no differentiation based on ethnicity. It's poured out on sons and daughters, men and women. There's no differentiation based on gender. Pretty simple. It's going to be poured out on everybody. Young and old, no differentiation based on age. Even on servants, no differentiation based on social status. All of those things that we love to divide over, God cares nothing about. They're meaningless in the scope of God pouring out his spirit. So, God's spirit is available to everybody, including us. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's go back to the passage. So verse 19, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the, great and, or before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a lot going on here, but it's really, it's highly picturesque language of God showing up, a theophany, God, God appears. The last days have started, that's what Peter is saying, this is what Joel was talking about in the last days. The last days have started, but there's a culmination to that last days period called the day of the Lord. And it's, it's talked about in various ways throughout the entire Old Testament and in the, into the New Testament as well. But the idea is always God's final intervention where he, uh, he punishes sin, he shows, up, he shows up into human affairs to punish sin, restore his people, and then establish his rule over the nations. So just like Joel's use that Peter is showing, the last day, or the day of the Lord, is always linked to messianic hope, and it's fulfilled in Jesus' return. Now, about this day, we don't know when it's coming. It's just that simple. If you see or somebody say it's happening on May 10th, don't worry about May 10th. They don't know. See this happen over and over again? But he's coming back. That's the deal. He's coming back. Everything's going to be made right. The day of the Lord's going to happen. But it'll be heralded and accompanied by signs, wonders, great upheaval in nature. Basically, God's going to flip the world on its ear. He's going to turn everything upside down. He's going to make it all right. So Peter goes on, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Again, the imperative to listen up. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you, or accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Remember, this is Pentecost. Folks got to show up three times a year. Every Israelite male is required to be in Jerusalem for these feasts. They were just in Jerusalem a couple of months before when the events of the Passover took place. And that's when Jesus was crucified. So as you yourselves know, this man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked, literally lawless men, I mean, talking about the Romans, people who don't have the law, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So even though Jesus is handed over to them, by God's plan, it doesn't release them from the guilt of having handed him, or of having rejected him and him being crucified. You know, it was their sin of rejecting him, it's our sin of rejecting him, uh, that places us at odds with God. And even though it's part of God's plan, it doesn't release us from our part in that. Does that make sense? Going on into verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. 
freeing him from the agony of death. The term used there is normally associated with childbirth. Kind of interesting, the freeing of the agony idea. And the point that Peter's making is it's no more possible for death to hold Jesus than for a pregnant woman who's ready to give birth to keep a child inside. It's not possible, it's coming. Uh, so remember Peter, the first of the apostles, is called equals, or the first among equals. Um, he's given his eyewitness testimony. And so now, going, in, going in back into the passage, he's going he's gonna to point to David, Israel's greatest king, for corroboration. David said about him, and Peter's quoting from Psalm 16, so he's talking about the Messiah Jesus. Um, I saw the Lord always before me, because he, has, he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. And that's the end of the quotation. Peter goes on to say, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. The location of David's tomb was well known. Even though David was a thousand years before Jesus, the location of the tomb is well known. Um, there was a, another guy named, I always get his name wrong, his name, first name's John, let's leave it at that, um, who robbed the tomb in, in roughly 130 BC. And so Herod thought that was a good idea too. So he went to rob the tomb, except that during Herod's attempt, when they opened the tomb, two of his, uh, two of his servants or two of the guys that were with him got consumed by fire that came out of the tomb when they opened the door. So Herod went, hmm, maybe not the best idea. And he built this marble, this white marble portico over the tomb of David. So designating it, it's a well-known place. It's like, look, we know where David's at. He's there to this day. So Peter's argument is that David couldn't have been talking about himself because David's body was in the place of the dead, his body did see decay. So he could not have been talking about himself. He goes on to say, but he, talking about David, was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Now we call this the Davidic covenant, and it's in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that it would be a forever kingdom. One of David's descendants would sit on the throne. So uh, we know that that's what was said. So David going on, or Peter going on about David, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he, the Messiah, was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we, that would be those on whom the Spirit had been poured out, are all witnesses of it. He's exalted to the right hand of God. He, that would be Jesus, has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, and yet he said, and Peter's going to quote Psalm 110 this time, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Let that sink in for a second. You know, Peter's talking to these guys like, you, whom you crucified, God made that guy Lord and Messiah. And the use of the word Lord here is in, is in common practice. Jews don't normally say the name of God. It's too holy, so they would substitute the Hebrew word Adonai. The Hebrew word Adonai in Greek is the word kurios, which gets translated Lord. Really, Peter's saying, made him Lord and Messiah. And so the Messiah, the one that the Jews had been waiting for for centuries, had come and they killed him. That's what Peter's telling them. He was here and you killed him. Your sin, your rejection of the Messiah, that's on you. Guess what? Our sin, our rejection of the Messiah, that's on us too. Because it was for forgiveness for sin that Jesus was crucified. We're celebrating the Lord's table today. We're going to talk about that. But it's our sin 
just like their sin, that had a hand in crucifying Jesus. You guys remember the movie uh, Passion of the Christ? Mel Gibson made it. You know that Mel Gibson had a cameo in that movie? I remember reading this story, it just fascinating to me. He didn't want his face in the movie. He didn't want to take away from the movie that was being done. He didn't want to put his mug in there. But he's got a cameo. And his cameo is he is one of the Roman soldiers who nails the cross, in, or nails the, the spikes into Christ's hands. He got it. I mean, honestly, he's got other issues, I know. That's okay. Everybody else does too. But this idea of it's, it's your sin, it's my sin, that nails Jesus to the cross, just like it was their sin, like Peter was telling them. It's pretty crazy stuff. So Peter closes, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Uh-oh. Holy, holy crap, what happened? Wait a minute. They're freaking out. It's like, what? They were cut to the heart. They heard what Peter said. They recognized their part in it. And they're trying to understand how to make it right. They understand that it's bad. And they're, they're freaking out trying to make it right. It's pretty amazing. That cutting to the heart is exactly what Jesus said would happen when the Holy Spirit came. Because it's the Holy Spirit that does the cutting. I'm going to take a look at a passage in John. Now, the context for this passage is it's the night before Jesus is crucified. He and his disciples are together. It's after the Last Supper. He's given them the last bit of teachings before he'll be arrested and then crucified. And he's explaining that he will send the Holy Spirit and telling them what the Holy Spirit's going to do. This is John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. When he, that would be the Holy Spirit, comes, he will prove to the world, or he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. That is a hugely laden passage, and we are not going to pick it apart today. But Peter's given his testimony. The scripture concurs with his testimony. And now the Holy Spirit is a third witness to, to tell these people what's going on. And that's evidenced by their reaction to the Holy Spirit cutting them to the heart. Just like he cuts us to the heart when our sin is, explode, is exposed. And they freak out. Brothers, what do we do? So Peter gives them the solution. Back into Acts, verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So this idea of repent, Greek words metanoia, Literally, it means to change your mind, to change one's mind, to change one's thinking. Stop being against God. Turn toward God. Now, repentance is the internal and correct response to the Holy Spirit's cutting of one's heart. We realize what's going on. Oops, is not a bad way to, to get there. You know, brothers, what do we do? You repent. You stop doing what you were doing. Start doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's that simple. So repentance is the, is the internal response. And then being baptized or immersed in water, Kevin talked about that a lot last week, is the outward symbol of the new reality. Every time we do a baptism, we see that symbolism. Being buried to the old life, going under the water, being buried to the old life. Rising up out of the water in new life. The water, the water washes us. We're immersed or we're baptized in the Spirit, which then enables us to live this new life. It's not, oh no, you got to go figure it out on your own. Flip it around and then, you know, go figure it out. It's, you get the Spirit, you repent, you get the Spirit, and the Spirit empowers you for living that new life. 
So we're, we're born of the Spirit, or as John says later on in, in chapter, as John says in chapter 3, we're born again. And I love this next part. It's a promise to you, your children, and all who are far off. That's us. Them, their descendants, and everybody that the Lord calls. It's just fantastic. And so Peter goes on, and, and Luke summarizes the rest of what's happening with Peter. He says, with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So Peter's warning is as applicable to us today as it was when he was talking to the guys in that first sermon. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Nothing has changed in the human condition since Genesis chapter 3. There's one way to get there. Peter's laid out what it is. Repent and be baptized in the name of Christ. So 3,000 accepted the message, meaning that they had repented, they had that internal change, and then they were baptized, and the church grew from 120 to 3,120. That's a pretty impressive sermon. And then next week, Pastor Kevin's going to look at what those, what those new believers did. That's the, the passage he's going to pick up on and what they did as a result of having encountered the Holy Spirit. As we're wrapping things up this morning, I want to give you three truths about the kingdom as a result of the fact that the Spirit has arrived. And so if you want to jot this down, you can. Number one, the kingdom is here now. It's here. These are the last days that the prophet Joel was talking about. The uh, the author of Hebrews says it like this, how, how the book of Hebrews opens. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe. Peter says that these are the last days that Joel was talking about. The author of Hebrews says that these are the last days. He's making the same point. And God did speak through the prophets, not just Joel, but this whole last days idea is just chock full throughout the prophets with Samuel, Amos, uh, Micah, Hosea, Isaiah, directly speaking to it, and the rest of them alluding to it. So the last days are here. But now that Jesus has come, it's all about him. It's through the Son and the outpouring of the Spirit that the Son does. So the promised kingdom has come through the promised Spirit from the promised Messiah. It started at Pentecost a couple of thousand years ago, and it's here right now. So the kingdom's here now. Number two, the kingdom is open to everyone. Everyone. Absolutely everyone. And trust me, there's theologians all over the place on this. But uh, John, in the prologue of his gospel, says it like this. This is out of John chapter 1. Yet to all who did receive him, that would be Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The kingdom's available to everyone, just like the rain we see today. We don't get rain very often. This is kind of cool when we do. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, says that God sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. The Spirit's poured out on all people. Now, there's a condition here, but it's not on God's part. It's on our part. The kingdom is available to anybody and everybody who receives Jesus. Doesn't matter, male or female, young or old, Servant or master, none of those differentiations, Jew or Gentile, none of those different, it's available to everyone. Those who receive him are born of God or born again. The kingdom's open to everyone, everybody. Just got to receive Jesus. That's the only requirement. And third, the kingdom is guaranteed by the Spirit. 
kingdom is guaranteed by the Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who believes. It's pretty amazing, and it's guaranteed by the Spirit. Paul says it like this in Ephesians, And you also, speaking to the Ephesians, were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So cool. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. There's more coming. Paul says that, that he can't even fathom the idea of what's coming. But it's good stuff. And the Holy Spirit, all of this good stuff that comes from the Spirit, that's just a down payment. So the Spirit came on Pentecost. So what? So everything. When we believe in Christ, we're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. God himself indwells us as a guarantee of the glory to come. It's just pretty stinking amazing. So, it's here now. It's open to everyone. It's guaranteed by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for, uh, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that enables us to escape from the things of our old life, our anger, our prejudice, our, uh, just our stuff. And Lord, that you're still doing that today. Father, as we, uh, as we pray today, I would pray that if anyone doesn't know you, that if, that if there's anyone here that hasn't accepted Christ, that they would today, and that they'd receive the Holy Spirit, get that guarantee of, of the glory to come and the ability to live a new life today. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word and just all the, the things that you pour out for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.